Joe presents TKO together with 32 Red. Welcome to TKO on Joe together with 32 Red. We're a podcast and YouTube show with you every Thursday. An absolute pleasure to sit down with one of the most influential men in boxing today. He's a Brooklynite. Uh, he's a former HBO sports exec turned boxing promoter. He's worked with the likes of Jermaine Taylor, Sergio Martinez, Bernard Hopkins. It is none other than Mr. Lou DeBella. As a man that time is in short supply for, thank you very much no, for no, giving us some of yours. Um, last night, Carl and I went to the Barclays Centre. David Diamante um, took us on, on a tour of his kind of neighbourhood and we relived that night nearly three you years ago. You smoked a cigar, you went to a cigar bar? We did. Yeah, we had a cigar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was great. And, um, and obviously I started just... Diamante in boxing, actually. Re yeah, we spoke very highly of you. And, um, and we relived we relive that night three years ago at the Barclays Centre. Of course, you were involved in the promotion of that fight um, and a terrific fight. And I know one that you remember fondly as well. That was a tremendous night. Yeah. yeah. Um, it this was guy's actually one of my favourite fighters. No, no BS. Oh, thank you very much. I enjoyed You're that. a warrior, man. You make good fights. You're entertaining. Thank you, you understand that people want to be entertained. Yeah. You know, it's a science, but it's a subset of the entertainment business. Mm. And, you know, Carl Frampton, when he goes out there, he gives 110%, he entertains. Thank you very uh, much. I like guys that go out there and throw down. That's my style of fighting. Yeah. Santa Cruz. It was a good fight, wasn't it? It was a good fight. And uh, obviously, I won that fight and very proud of that. It was a great fight. Second fight, I lost. But again, another good fight. And I suppose that's... If you're, coming up, if you're losing a fight, but it's still an exciting fight, it's kind of... We're too hung up on losses in the stupid... I, I agree. We, I mean, Completely MMA agree. has it right. If you're yeah. in a great fight, who gives a shit? Yeah. I mean, I, I kept... Um, televising Arturo Gatti, whether he went, won or lost. Because to me, he was the highlight reel fighter of my, you know, my heyday at HBO. You know, he was the guy that you could throw at every time and you knew you were getting World War III. The, pe the people love him. Uh, I mean, him, he was a star. They, they, you know, he could sell out Atlantic City quicker than, than anybody higher than him on a pound for pound list. Um, and he never failed to put on a war, a blood and guts struggle where, where you got everything out of him, win, lose, or draw. And people cheered him the same way if he left the ring a victor or a loser. It didn't matter to the public. And it should, if the public, you know what, we're, again, we're in the entertainment business. People want to watch you. This is why, like, records are so meaningless. You can get a ham sandwich to 15-0 and 0 record. And you can get a ham sandwich <laughs> world-rated if you write the, not, the, 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 the correct charitable mm. donation yeah. or, or, frankly, <laughs> bribe. But you can get a guy rated, anyone rated, mm. and you can you can get anyone to a great record. It's not about that. It's what you're doing when you get in there with the high level of competition. Mm. How do you perform? How much of yourself do you, are you willing to give? The thing about your fights with Santa Cruz that made them so special is they were wars, but they were wars fought at an extremely high skill level. Mm. But when it came down to it, Santa Cruz's mentality, his mentality, it's the same mentality. They're fighters. Yeah. Mm. You know, the fighters through and through. So what you got was you got a throw down war fought at extremely high skill level to me. That's, that's what it's all about. Like, um, that's the best of boxing. Your old stable mate, Josh Taylor, was in a similar style matchup against uh, Ivan Branchik, uh, one of your guys in the Super Series. Are you still working with um, Regis Progress? Yeah, yeah, Regis so and, and Ivan. Look, Ivan's a terrific fighter. I mean, I, there was a lot... Of, the World Boxing Super Series is a great idea, and, and I'm completely supportive of what they're trying to do. They need to promote it better. They need to get their stuff together because they've had some economic issues. Yeah, yeah. You know, Baranchek didn't really know if he was going to go. It was close, know. wasn't it? There were some issues between the, his management and the, and the tournament. There were legitimate issues. They resolved them, but, I, but he changed trainers in, yeah. right before the fight. He moved, relocated his, his wife and himself from mm. Florida to California a month before the fight. I'm not going to give an excuse because I, I, I tend to think it would have been a similar fight. And he, I'm, I'm not making excuses for him. He's 24 years old. He can punch like a mule, strong fighter. And I think what you saw after he got knocked down those multiple times by Taylor early in that fight, the guy's a heart of a lion. Mm. I, I think Baron Schick will be a, a champion at some point. It's a great he's, fighter. He's, he's a young great kid. fight. That was, yeah. uh, he, so it was about, it wasn't until about three or four weeks before when we actually knew that Baron Schick was actually going to fight. Correct. It's difficult to train properly for a fight, even if you think the fight may come off. But if you're in a camp, not really knowing, not having a concrete yes or no whether this fight's going to happen. Yeah. It's hard to put a full amount of effort into it, and I understand I, his you know, I, I, I think you didn't see the best of Branchick for a lot of reasons. At the same time, I actually think that Taylor fought to entertain. He was at home. Yeah. I, I think he took chances he might not have had to take. Um, I, I, he's a terrific fighter. I, I love the fight with Pro Gray and, and Taylor. So you, you guys are on different sides of the fence of that, because I know Josh is a good friend of yours, and obviously yeah. Regis is your fighter. Um, talk to me about how you see it going. It's going to be a sensational fight. 
I, 50-50? I, I actually do. I'm going to be honest. I think that, no, I, I mean, I, I'm going to a little bit tip to my end. Uh, I just think that if, if I was looking at the division right now from everything I've seen, the body of work with everybody, I, I would say at the moment that, that I would say Pro Gray is the top 140-pounder in the world. But I'd say that Taylor's number two. So, you know, I wouldn't be – I mean, it, it, it's certainly a contest. It's mm, going to be yeah. – you know, the outcome is in doubt. Uh, but I, I'm, I am comfortable – I mean, I, I like my side of that equation. Of course. I, I think it's I think it's a great fight. It's going to be very very exciting. What I did notice was I got a photograph with with Progre, um in Glasgow. He's not that big for a light welterweight. He had he had like kind of big basketball shoes on, and I'm not a big guy, and he was only a little bit bigger than me. Taylor's a Taylor's a big light welterweight, and I think that's where he's not as long as him. Taylor. You're right. He's not as long. He doesn't have the. I don't. I mean, he he's. More solid, Taylor, different shape. I also yeah. think that, that, that the thing about Progre that makes him so unpredictable, the angles are unusual. Mm. Like his, mm. he, a lot of what he does, he has a very good trainer in, in, in uh, Bobby Benton, but a lot of what, what Progre does is sort of born in you. And, and um, he can hit with tremendous power with both hands yeah. from bizarre angles. You know, it, it, that gives him a little bit of, you know, I think they're both punchers, but... I actually think Progre is the superior puncher because he's the most unpredictable puncher. Mm. I think in terms of punching power, Josh Taylor's probably not the strongest guy in the world, but he's very accurate and very sharp with his punches, and that's when it, that's when he knocks people over and he knocks people out sometimes. Um, in terms of like, you know, pushing big weights in the gym, he's not that strong, but he's so accurate and fast. That's when he can hurt people. It's a sensational fight. Yeah. And I've been telling the zone people like promote this fight. I mean, you have. You know, the, the World Boxing Super Series, they got to promote this fight. It's a sensational fight. Mm. And that other kid, Inouye, is a beast. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a final that's going to be. Um, I want to take you back to, to kind of your journey into to boxing, and we've got a kind of limited amount of time. Um, we were talking about the, the Barclays Centre earlier. A couple of miles away is the neighbourhood of Flatbush, where you grew up. I grew up there, yeah. Um, you, you grew up watching fights with, with your grandpa, was well, right? my grandparents. Yeah, my, my grandfathers were Italian immigrants. And um, when I was, a, like, a little kid, like, five, four years old, um, Nino Benvenuti was fighting against like Emil Griffith and Tiger. Tiger, uh, trying to think of the other guys he fought. And a lot of them. He had a lot of big fights in the United States and, and fights that were televised in the United States. Mm. And my grandparents, like, they got into baseball because it was American, but they were like, it was soccer, mm. you know, football. Yeah, yeah. And here, when I was a kid, there was no football on television. Right. Like, there was no soccer on TV when I was a kid. And so, from my from my grandparent, my grandfather's boxing was the sport that was here that they grew up with. Right. So I watched, you know, and, and then they, they became baseball fans and they got me into baseball, but I, I watched boxing with my grandfathers. And, and, um, and then I saw Ali, I was like six years old, the f first time I saw an Ali fight, and I was like, oh my God, who is this? Mm. Like, I mean, he was so, like, had such a great, you know, look. I mean, he was this beautiful man, this, this like, animal in the ring. Yeah. Most well-spoken athlete I'd ever seen, period. And um, he was like a rock star. And, and that was it. I mean, I was hooked on boxing. Between my grandfathers and Ali, I was hooked on boxing. We were talking about the, the cultural influence here of, uh, and this might sound stupid, but the Rocky movie in, in the mid-70s. Oh, no, no, no. It was stupid. Ali, Frazier, Foreman. No. And then the Rocky movie was, what, mid-70s. What did that do? Because you would have been a teenager. Oh, no, no. It, it, it solidified my desire to get into sports. Did it really? As a, as a, a living, to get into sports. Or actually, it's interesting, sports or entertainment. You know, because the Rocky movie was a movie, and then I, the story of how Stallone made the movie, on you yeah. know, and and um, yeah, I know my my biggest influences other than my family, in, in terms of sports and, and, and boxing, were Rocky Balboa, and Muhammad Ali. Wow. So you know, it was a huge influence, and and it's interesting. Boxing is absolutely not in this country what it is in the UK. It's not. I mean, in the UK, it is ingrained as one of the premier sports. It's yeah. still. In, in the UK, the sport of kings. We've also got less competition, haven't we, in terms of mainstream it's a smaller, sports? It's a smaller pool as well, and you've got, obviously, different regions all over. Yeah, but you don't, here's the thing. We have base, baseball, yeah, American yeah. football, NBA, hockey. Football, box, and rugby. You know, and and the, uh, UFC yeah. is, 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 is out of the US. Mm, yeah. And we are literally, like, on that totem pole, we are below all of those. Yeah, yeah. However, you look at the best movies made about sports, Raging Bull, yeah. all the Rocky movies, mm. Cinderella Man, um, and go through the list. There, there are so many great, great films that have been made about boxing. The books written about boxing, the, the Broadway plays done about boxing. Boxing is still part of 
the, the fabric of culture here, but it's not as a sport anywhere near where it once was. Mm. You know, when I was a kid, it was still one of the, the, ma- the biggest sports in America. When my, my dad was a kid, it was arguably number one, you know? Um, it, it's not that now. And even the fact that you have DAZN USA now, you have ESPN Plus, mm. you have the PBC doing broadcast TV. There's, there's more boxing now being purchased and televised than ever before in my lifetime, probably, in terms of hours of boxing out there. But it's not the number of people watching it that were watching it when I was a kid. I mean, it's the reason, frankly, that so many people are buying it as content is it's cheap content. Right. They can't afford the NFL. I mean, it's billions of dollars to get a big NFL pack. I mean, it's crazy money. The, 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 you know, boxing. There are barriers to entry to get into boxing if you've got some money. First of all, anyone can get into boxing. Right. Anyone can be a promoter. Anybody can be a manager. And frankly, anybody can be a fighter. Mm. Yeah. As is proven by some of the opponents you see, you know, (laughs) (laughs) know, whatever. But any, any, I mean, there there were, like, boxing's the Wild West. I've often referred to it like we, in Westerns here, there's there's, uh, Dodge City is like the uh, city that's always like the, you know, the home of the gunfighter in Westerns here. Boxing's like Dodge City. We're sort of like the red light district of sports. <laughs> yeah. That's a great way to yeah, describe it. I've never heard that before, but that is a fantastic way to describe boxing. Red right light city, a district of, yeah. uh, of sport, yeah. Um, so no, I think it was 1989 or 1990, you joined HBO Sports. Um, what was your ambition when you first joined? Because you would have been in your what, late 20s at that point. Um, I was a lawyer. I was making a lot of money. For a kid, I mean, for someone in their 20s, I was making a lot of money. I took a... I, I, I took a salary that was 30% of what I was making at the law firm to go to HBO when I took the job. And it was because I was, wasn't happy. And I, I, I always wanted to be in sports or entertainment. And it's sort of a weird story, but I was, I was interviewing for a job at the New York Yankees. And at the time, George Steinbrenner, who's a very famous name here in the United States, was the, the, the president and the, the guy in charge of the Yankees. And um, it was, the job was narrowed down between me and two other people. And I had taken a day off from the law firm I called in sick or whatever to, to go interview at, at, at the Yankees for the fall. I'd already had three interviews. It was the last interview and I was down to a couple of people. Right before I left my house, I got a phone call sent basically saying that George Steinbrenner thought I was too young, that he wasn't going to hire a, a guy in his 20s for a job this big. He apologized through his secretary. Um, and then the secretary <laughs> could hear, like, I was totally deflated on the phone. Like, I just sounded yeah, like, yeah. fuck. You know, I mean, I was very, really depressed. And she was, I don't know if this helps you, but one of the other two guys that are interviewing for this position was talking about a, a job open at HBO Sports as a lawyer. So when I heard that immediately, like I mean, HBO was boxing. <coughs> In the United States for, for most of 40 years, yeah. HBO was boxing. Hmm. And I was like, literally I had my suit on already, I had my resume in my pocket. I just went over to the HBO building and literally snuck past security and went up to the office of the head lawyer at HBO and and um, begged his secretary and, you know, flirted. I mean, I was, at that point I was young and attractive and I had air. And I was like, you know, I was like flirting with the secretary trying to like, see if she could like just call the guy and see if I can get five minutes with him. And then the guy saw me standing there and he thought it was so funny that I had the nerve to, to just come to his office and split past mm. security that he sat down with me and he said, well, we're about to make an offer to somebody today. And I said, you're going to offer the wrong guy the job because I know more about boxing than anyone in this building. And I went to Harvard Law School. I got a good resume. I'm, my resume can't be worse than the guy's, but I guarantee you I know more about boxing than he does. And then he sent me up to Seth Abraham's office, who was the president of HBO Sports at the time. We talked boxing and baseball for about an hour and a half. And then that was Friday, and Monday morning I got a job. That's a great story. And then within a year or two, I was out of law. And my salary was back above where it used to be. Right. Um, but and it took, doing something you, know, you loved. Doing something I loved. But at that point, I, I had the job really to buy the fights and, and to make the fights for HBO, right. which I did for most of the 1990s. Yeah. And I got to work with a lot of really good people, and, and um, it was a great experience, you know? It was, a, it was a golden era, Roy Jones Jr., Bernard Hopkins, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. We had Lennox Lewis and, and Prince Nassim Hamid, who I know... Well, I brought Hamid over to the States. Exactly, I signed yeah. Lennox to his first pro contract. Yeah. I signed De La Hoya to his first pro contract, Mayweather to his first pro contract. You know, um, Am I right in thinking you brought Nassim Hamid from, from Showtime to HBO? Did you walk him away from a contract at, at he Showtime? He wasn't really so much at, at Showtime. He, was, he, was, he hadn't really fought in the States. He hadn't come... I mean, I, my view at the time with, with, with Naz was, like, he was such a showman. His, mm-hmm. his, his act and what he did was so different than anyone else 
that he had to be seen here. Did like, you like him? As uh, a, as a... I, I did. I still like him. I talked to him last week. What did you... I, I hated him as a kid. As did a you? kid, I, I don't know, maybe it's just where I'm from. And I was very influenced by my dad, old-fashioned Belfast man. He hated yeah. any flashiness. Mm. And Prince was the flash. Flashiest man yeah, that yeah. I'd ever seen. He was an anti. Yeah. Well, you know, I grew up. I grew up on Ali. All right. So Ali, you know, was, was the showman, also. And then you know, the scene was over the top. And by the way, for the other thing was, I knew I had a sense of this. He was going to be bigger here than he was there. Yeah. Like he was going to be bigger on this side of the pond, because and, and and in fact, when he fought Kevin Kelly at Madison Square Garden, and he had that 20 minute entrance into the ring. No one knew who we like. The, the, the crowd was there because we spent so much money. Entrance after, was insane. Was that the, but, fl the flag? But the whole. Yeah, yeah. But, but there were. But there were like twelve thousand people dancing in the audience with him. They were all rooting. Like they, most of those people came rooting for Kevin Kelly. But this guy comes in the ring. This little, you know. <laughs> and that fight. I mean. Oh. This little kid from Yemen comes yeah. into the ring and he's booging into the <laughs> ring. It takes him twenty minutes. Kelly's in the ring, standing there, pissed off. He's like. Get in the ring, you piece of shit! Like you know, he's like standing there, and, the, the, and he's taking his sweet time. And then, but by the time he got in the ring, the whole crowd was dancing with him. Wow! And then, within like a round or two, he had been on his ass already. How mad! And so was Kevin. But they were just down and they down. They were up and, and down. Oh, it was oh, like, not, I mean, you couldn't have scripted. Like, I mean, it was really. That was my favorite fight as a kid. Oh, it was a great oh, yeah. fight. And, oh, and it's when, when Prince fought Kevin Kelly, funny story. A very well-known British journalist, who will not mention her name, and I was told this by another British journalist, said. Not knowing really who Kevin Kelly was, it's always hard to beat an Irish man in the garden. Mm. That was the headline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you're of a, of a By the way, Irish fight fans, we, I mean, yeah, this serious. is still a great, a, a great city for, for an Irish fighter. Yeah. You know, of course. It, it, Irish fight fans, Polish fight fans. Well, Fla Flatbush was, it had an Irish contingent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I grew, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I went to. Yeah. Grammar school. I went to Catholic schools too. It was all Irish kids and Italian mm -hmm. kids when I was a, a kid. Um, you know, things. The, the neighborhoods have changed. Areas have changed. Mm -hmm. You know, Brooklyn is completely different than it was when I was a child. I mean, now it's like, it's the uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. Yeah. When, I, when I was a kid, yeah. it was like you know, like you know, we'd go to get ten cents slice of pizza. It's, it's, and we'd, we'd play with you know, we'd play baseball in the street. Changed with, massively you know. in the last like two years, three years since I was here last. It's mm -hmm. like changed massively around that Gleasons and stuff. We're a train, like they're, they're building. No, oh, oh, that, that area around Gleason is basically like Manhattan now. I mean, Brooklyn is like, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's so cost prohibitive and it's very, very expensive. And, you know. But uh, no, it, the, 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 the Irish market here has been a tremendous one for boxing. Mm. Uh, you are listening to and watching TKO on Joe, together with 32 Web, myself, Chris Lloyd, Carl Frampton. Uh, you can subscribe via the usual channels. Now, here's Nick Bright and Graham Swan with news uh, for something else from Joe. Nice one, guys. Swanee's Cricket Show, then. What is it all about? Well, it's a new podcast from Joe with me, Nick Bright, and the man himself, Graham Swan, because it would be so weird if you weren't here and we called it that. Good point. And it's going to be great. We've got all the biggest names. We've got the best games. Ashes World Cup, inside gossip, all the scoops. It's got everything. Uh, and also some stories from you, I'm hoping. Absolutely. I'm going to bring... I'm throwing people under the bus. All of you. You won't sleep in your beds, Jimmy. <laughs> Cookie. <laughs> Brody, good <laughs> he's, luck, lads. He's calling them out. Uh, right, remember to subscribe to this because we're coming at you every single week, but we should let the nice people get back to their podcast now. Yeah, sorry about the ambush. You're watching TKO, together with 32 Red. Thanks, guys. Good luck with the show. Uh, we're back here with promoter Lou DiBella. Um, you are of a generation kind of equidistant between the, the old guard of promoters, the Don Kings, the, the Bob Arams, I know those guys are still going, and the new breed, the Eddie Hearns, the, the braggadocios that he's yeah, but I, trying I mean, to make. When, when, I, uh, when I first got into boxing, his dad was, you know, one of the old school promoters. Well, actually, his dad was in the position I would say I'm in now. Mm. You know what I mean? And that was well said. You didn't say I was an old fuck. You just said <laughs> you're not one of you're not, you're not Aram or King or one of the old guys, but you're not one of the young guys either. Yeah. Which is accurate. Respect respect your elders, yeah. <laughs> which absolutely. is accurate. Which um, is accurate. What do you, I mean, you have to have, I mean, I, I, your I mean, wits about you to deal with, with guys like, like Eddie Hearn, Bob, Bob Aaron, Don King. You, you have to be on your game when you're dealing with men like that. How I've been dealing with them my whole professional life, though. I'm 30 years, it'll be 30 years I'm in boxing in November, right? It's a long time to be dealing so with guys So it's 30 like years. I've been dealing with these guys from day one. And, and, and I had a pretty high level job as a young guy. So I was like the young guy dealing with these guys who were much more established. Mm, and, yeah. and I had no choice. Was, you, you learn, you know, you have to walk through the fire. Yeah. Fighter has to walk through the fire. I had to walk through the fire. Dealing with Don King, Bob Arum, you know. Eddie's, a, you know, Eddie, Eddie really is in that, in that like, you know, that, that new type of promoter. And part of it is, 
I think Eddie's realizing it's a lot harder in the United States than he thought it would be. You yeah, know, of course. I, I think that the sport being that much bigger in the UK, you're able as a, a young guy to do the kind of young guy things, mm. social media. Yeah. I mean, promotion by Twitter, promotion by Instagram, promotion by YouTube, video, interview. Eddie's a star. It's in really easy in the UK for him yeah, as is, well. Yeah. Yeah. Coming yeah. here is a completely Well, he's also, story. I mean, he, he's a celebrity in his own right over there. Yeah. No one yeah. gives a fuck about him here. Yeah. I mean, and frankly, then people really give a fuck about me here. In the city, yeah, because I've been 30 years in the city. But, but for the most part here, the promoter's not the story, it's the fighter, it's the mm. fight. And even the fighter in the fight, we said, we were talking about this before we got on, you know, we, we, start, we started taping. The, the average fighter, American fighter, can walk through Times Square in New York City, a world champion, a guy that's made a million dollars or more in a fight, and, and among boxing hardcore fans is a completely recognizable you know, person, can walk through a major street in New York and not be noticed mm. at all. And by the way, you take him out of his, his boxing shorts, you know, they're not doing, these guys aren't getting the same media attention as a uh, American football player, an NBA player, etc. So, like, you know, it took a long time for Deontay Wilder to get traction. It had nothing to do with Deontay Wilder. Mm. And frankly, putting people to sleep and almost killing them is what, right now, that whole, you know, destructive kind of, kind of aspect of Deontay, it's what allows his, his star to rise. I suppose you need that highlight reel moment to pierce through so much content that's being pumped out every day in such a huge country. I mean, Anthony, AJ is a superstar in the UK. Yeah. I mean, in the, yeah. not only the UK, all of Europe. I mean, you go, there's several countries around the world that he can't walk around in without being mm. harassed. Mm. He can walk around the city. Really in New York, it's madness. So he, he is a, he's, a, he's a superstar in my eyes back home, being from the UK, but it's just mad to think that Anthony Joshua can walk down a packed street, walk through Times Square without getting any hustle at all. We're still, we're still very marketable as a sport. We still command attention when we do the biggest events. You know, we're, we're capable of getting big audiences on television or in an arena and generating tens, hundreds of millions of dollars for the product. But we are much more of a niche sport here. Yeah. We're not a, you are a grassroots big time sport in the UK. Yeah. It's not it's that big way fish, here. small pond, isn't it? Do you, do you ever see that changing here? Um, it, it, well, you know, it, 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 the question should be, do you see it changing back? Yeah, and, and, and when right. it took most of a century, literally, it took, you take a century <laughs> where the sport went from <laughs> the top of the pinnacle of the sports world to descending below baseball, below NFL, below basketball, below professional hockey, um, at this point, you could argue below MMA, in the, at least in the United States. Mm. Uh, if you look at empirical data, it appears that, that you know, I think that yeah. MMA also has its issues right now, but combat sports in general, I, I don't think we can stamp our foot and say we're even the biggest combat sport mm. in mm. the United States. We're, you know, we're not. Mm. Um, we're competing with, with MMA, with UFC. Um, is that creating more crossover stars, MMA? I mean, we've seen Conor McGregor do it, Ronda Rousey do it. One of your fighters, Heather Hardy, has kind of moved from boxing to MMA. Is there a reason why? It's, it's certainly for female fighters. You know fighters. the reason is for females? Go on. They can't make money. Yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there's, there's... And let's face it, look, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's done, done some um, good for, the, for women's boxing. I mean, he's... Katie's, look, Katie's a star because Katie's, Katie is that, that conquering hero in Ireland, the mm. way AJ was a conquering hero coming back to the... The UK. I mean, she was the most brilliant a a amateur that Ireland produced um, in the last few years, recent years, uh, irrespective of, of gender. Yeah. You know, yeah. so she's a superstar yeah. in Ireland. Um, women, women here, women in MMA don't make the money men in MMA make. Women don't make the money in any. Women don't make the money in any in, sport. In any sport that the yeah. men make. Um, here, however, there's not even a, really a platform. Heather Hardy won a world title. She sells more tickets than literally 90% of the professional male fighters and in the biggest market in, in New York. And she's a world champion now, legitimate world champion, won a world title on HBO before it, it, it shut down. And she can't, she's fighting MMA on Bellator. For money? Uh, just to make a just few. Just to make a few bucks. Wow. She's a single mom. And right now she's waiting for, for a big fight and not being able to get that big fight She's fine, and I can't, what am I gonna tell her? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. Heather, I don't have, I mean, I can put you in a small fight, but, you know, and, and, and by the way, Bellator, even though she's not making big money on Bellator, they're putting her in a big, a big kind of position where there's sponsorship money and other dollars she could re realize. She's a single mom. 
She's got to earn a living. Got to yeah. support her kid. Mm. You know, there's. Uh, do I see it changing? Was was the original question. I think if there was another, um, it's going to take some time for things to change. You would need some maybe a transcendent athlete. If there's an, another yeah. Ali appeared, another Mike Tyson appeared, and it captured the attention of everyone. If something happened in, in the next few years and, 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 and Wilder is able to knock everyone out and the big fights do happen, which I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm pessimistic about, I'm, I'm realistic about. It's going to be very hard. Big fights are going to happen, but there's so much bullshit that people are going to have to, of course, going to have to navigate. I mean, right now when you have, come on, I mean, it, you, ESPN has a deal with, with Fury. Mm. And basically, Fury's the poster child of heavyweight boxing for top rank at Aram mm -hmm. and ESPN and Frank Warren and and is it BT what's his BT Sport, yeah. BT Sport. Yeah. Sport. Yeah. So he's got he's in that he's the center of that universe. Yeah. AJ's the cent, the center of the matchroom the zone yeah. universe. Yeah. And Deontay is attached to PBC, mm. which is a brand, but I guess PBC does business pretty much right now with Fox, uh, you know, Fox Television, FS1, Showtime, but it's the PBC brand. As l you have three distinct and separate roads. A and it's not so easy to navigate them yeah. because ESPN's throwing its money and promotional power behind Fury. They don't want to see Fury's biggest fight go to a competing... On, on the zone. Or, going yeah. to a competing streaming service? No. Mm, no. And, and, and Heyman doesn't really want to see or PBC really doesn't want to see one of their biggest stars fighting on another platform. So, so what, you're, what you're essentially getting at is that it's going to be the Lewis Tyson maybe the Pacquiao scenario where there is a, a collaboration between the networks to get this fight yes, over but, the line. But you know what? It's, it was easy to collaborate when you had one basic cable network yeah. and another basic, I'm no, sorry, one premium cable network. Um, you know, distinction being premium cable, you pay the monthly subscription. Okay. Basic cable, you get it when you buy cable TV. Right. Like ESPN, pretty much everyone gets ESPN. Yeah. You have to avert, like, like, pay for Showtime, yeah, pay for yeah, HBO. Yeah, yeah. But when HBO had one guy, Showtime had the other guy, it was sort of, how do you like, it's, it's good. I'm not saying it can't be done. It mm. can be done. And I'm going to say, you know, to your, the people that are listening and watching, it, it will be done. I don't know that all three of them will still be around when it'll get done, but they'll figure it out. And these, the big fights, uh, eventually the public will demand it. And if all three of these guys keep winning, There'll be so much money in one of the fights, and there'll be there'll be such a desire for the fight to occur that they'll figure out a way. We were speaking to Matthew Macklin yesterday about it, and and he he thinks that potentially you could see a fight with Wilder and Joshua within the first part of next year. I don't see that happening at all, and it sounds like you don't see it happening either that soon. Well, I, I certainly don't see it happening this year. And do I see it happening early next year? I mean, you never know. It's gonna. Here's what's gonna have to happen. There's going to have to be a decision made on the part of the decision makers. And I'm not saying the fighters, because though they should be part of the decision making. Yeah. I'm saying the decision makers. That includes the DAZN brass. Mm. That includes, you know, Heyman and, and, and his network partners at PBC. Yeah, yeah. ESPN and Arrow. The decision has to be made. We want to make one of these big fights. Yeah. And then it's going to take some period of time to figure it out. Because at some point, you know, a little bit like with Mayweather Pacquiao, we, we got there in the end, but what you were watching was not the prime version of the guys that you wanted to see fight. Yeah. And if this goes on any longer, I mean, Wilder's, what, 33 this year, um, Joshua's gonna be 30. If, if this carries on for too long, there will be a, a point where all of this stuff, whatever's getting in the way, becomes detrimental to the legacy of the eventual fight, if it happens, right? You know, people talk about you know sit, let, letting something stew, letting yeah, the something marinating simmer, process, let it yeah. marinate. Okay, well, you know what? I don't know about marinating, but you can stew <laughs> and simmer so long yeah, yeah, yeah. that you overcook the shit. Exactly, yeah. that's what I'm saying. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, and, and, by, and by the way, part of what makes this era so interesting with the top heavyweights, I love Fury. He, he, I, I love listening to him. I, I, I like his whole <laughs> shit. I mean, I like, and I like him personally. Yeah. I mean, I got to know him a little bit, and I like the guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I find him compelling uh, as a person. He's got vulnerabilities, mm. though. Major vulnerabilities. Mm. Deontay is still my friend. I like Deontay. Deontay's, and, and, and that punching power, man, he, he, he can knock down a wall. I mean, and he's I, vulnerable, too. I'm very vulnerable. And Joshua's vulnerable. Of course, yeah. and that's what makes They're it. all vulnerable. That's what Val is doing. And Joshua has vulnerability. Like, they're all vulnerable. They're yeah. all vulnerable in different ways. And, and, but when you have vulnerable fighters, there's something usually upsets the apple cart. Yeah. Mm. The whole art, the know, whole art the is for them all to, to beat each other as well. Yeah. You know, believing that they're gonna, they, they can keep going out there exactly. and, and, and something unforeseen 
doesn't happen. The Lewis Rackman scenario. It's boxing, man. Yeah. Something right. unforeseen usually happens at it's some point. Huge risks are taken, waiting and waiting and waiting. Yeah. These fights can happen. If they happen soon, it's... Just imagine Wilder, for example, who had a pretty tough fight against Ortiz. Mm. And even wobbled against Brazil in that in that frantic two and a half what minutes. Happened, they what were, happens they were if fighting. he gets beaten his next fight? Well, the, the value of that Joshua fight. Gets well, the value beat. of that fight goes through the floor. Well, look, I mean, jo Joshua, you know, Joshua's not getting beat. I mean, no, no, no offense to, to to Andy Ruiz. You don't see that happening no. at all. No. I mean, let me, unless he breaks his leg or has some. some <laughs> oh, by the way, what, by the time this goes out, we, we'll know. So. I mean, and I'm not taking. I, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not taking anything away from Ruiz. The danger for Joshua, however, Ruiz is a very slick boxer. He really doesn't look the part. Mm. But, you know, like, there's certain foods where you look at them and it looks bad, but they taste good. <laughs> I mean, Ruiz looks bad, but, but Ruiz is a much better fighter than he looks. I agree. And what Ruiz might be capable of is exposing, you know, Joshua a little bit. Mm. You know, Joshua's not really fighting only his opponent here. He's fighting people's expectations of what he's supposed to do right. to his opponent. If he exposes him a little bit, does that make a Wilder or a Fury fight easier to make, you think? I don't know, maybe. If he exposes him a lot, it may make it a little yeah. bit easier yeah. to make. Right. If, if, I'll tell you, here's a flip side of it. If he wins, but, but it goes almost the distance, which no one expects, and he wins a decision, which mm. no one's expecting, mm. it, it may, in, in some ways, delay the fight a little longer because yeah. the fight didn't get any more valuable. Yeah. You know, the one thing, People can say the Brazil fight didn't sell out the Barclay Center, and it didn't. And they can say the rating wasn't incredible, and it, and it wasn't. But the knockout was incredible. And that, and, and Showtime, <laughs> and Wilder, and PBC, they all got the benefit of that clip of that knockout, that devastating knockout where the guy looked like he literally looked like he got shot by a bazooka. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he looked like he got shot. And that is, a, that is a value builder for, for the, for the narrative and then, of the fight. And then, and, and, then, and the number of people that saw that knockout on social media of some variety or the clip in some way mm. is hundred, probably hundreds of millions. Yeah. A hundred million. It's like or, a half-court buzzer beater, isn't it? it right, it, where the clip becomes... Like, yeah, it's, where, it's whatever you watch, like, I don't watch basketball, but I'll see that clip as a, as a casual sports fan. Anyone else will, will see that clip. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that clip even though you could make the argument it wasn't the biggest fight on earth, that clip elevated mm. Wilder. It's Certainly good. made him a more of a household name in the United States. Yeah, the point. clip was seen by everybody, my, my friends. I have a lot of friends who just don't know anything about boxing. They don't know who AJ is, they don't know, they don't know anything about boxing, but they were calling me going, man, Wilder, wow, he almost killed that guy. Da, 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 da. And these are guys that had never called me about boxing. Mm. So it's, in my mind, what, you know, and I know the, the people are gonna, the fight's gonna have taken place already, if Josh was able to pull off some some highlight real knockout of, of his own, that's certainly going to help his, his <coughs> star power. That's what that's what you'd be here. looking for as well. Mm. And 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 if it turns out to be something of a stinker of a fight, it doesn't help as much as he would have liked. So there's pressure on him not only to win. There's pressure on him to perform mm. in a way that gets people's attention. Yeah. Well, for the good of boxing, let's let's hope it's the. Uh... The last round of two. Um, Lou, pleasure to speak to you. Before we go, uh, we have a regular section of our show, which is just kind of a word association. So I've got a list of words here. I'm going to read them out to you, and I want you to say the first thing that comes to mind. Um, so this is 32 second challenge with 32 reds. Uh, with Lou DiBella, uh, Flatbush. Home. Harvard Law. Good credential. Working at the World Trade Center. Uh, a great memory, heartbreaking. Mm. HBO. A great memory, heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, the state of boxing on television today. Transitional. Nice. Uh, minor league baseball. My heart. Uh, Bernard Hopkins. An enigma. Sylvester Stallone. An icon. Uh, Frampton Santa Cruz won. Where boxing's supposed to be. <laughs> uh, Paulie Malinaji. Complicated kid. <laughs> uh, great commentator. Yeah, he is, isn't he? Uh, Deontay Wilder. Destructive force. Anthony Joshua. UK superhero. The life of a boxing promoter. No easier than the life of the fighter. Carl Frampton. Warrior. Awesome. Lou DiBella, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lou. Coming Coming on good, man. Great, Great to see you. On. Enjoy fight week. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Uh, our thanks to Lou DiBella, Carl, as always. And thank you at home for watching. This has been another episode of TKO on Joe Together with 32 Red done and dusted. As always, we'll see you again in seven days' time. You've been watching TKO on Joe Together with 32 Red.